just want to say a huge thanks to um, to Art360, 360 Dax and John Hansard and particularly to Edward for inspiring us all for today for thanks so much for inviting me to be part of it. I'm coming, like Hugo, I'm coming from a slightly different place and I'm talking about sort of documentary or my work engages with the documentation in the archiving with sort of ephemeral um, experiential immaterial practices, i.e. performance and live art. And at the Live Art Development Agency we do lots of work around documentation and around archives and archiving and that's sort of partly to sort of um, to sort of influence history but also to a certain extent to try and kind of make history but also more importantly to, to get an understanding of how we've got to now basically what kind of artistic practices, what kind of artists have created the culture that artists are now operating in and how do we use those kind of things to, to think about to think about the future. And I'm just going to very quickly say a few things and grossly oversimplify all kinds of complex issues. Fortunately, Hugo's presentation touched on all of those, some of those issues in, in brilliant ways. So I just want to say a few words about sort of performance documentation and, 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 and archives. So, sort of performance art has always been sort of, as we all know, sort of marginalised from most sort of official art histories. And part of that marginalisation has been because there hasn't been very much material evidence of it. There's been this lack of documentation. And particularly for sort of marginalised artists within marginalised fields, so sort of black artists, queer artists, women artists, there's been that sort of double whammy of, of, of sort of marginalisation, which has meant all kinds of exclusions, exclusions from official art histories, exclusions from sort of issues of sort of cultural value, critical value and commercial, commercial value. But in the recent years, technology has just changed everything. So sort of ironically for an area of practice that's all about live experiences, sort of digital technology has changed everything. So camera technology, there's huge advances in camera technology has just changed the sort of landscape really. Um, previously, it was, you know, you needed huge cameras and whole kinds of setups to document performance, and now it's very rare to go to a, any kind of performance event where, um, you know, not everybody in the room is documenting it. Mark and I were at a festival in, in China, and uh, I think I was the only person in the room not documenting the work, and that was only because my camera had been stolen the day before. <laughs> um, but more importantly than sort of the, the, the capacity to, to document the work is, is what's happened in terms of online technologies. So the capacity is now to be able to sort of disseminate, to research, to publish, to create all kinds of online archives in ways that sort of bypass the gatekeepers of official culture. So it's no longer sort of important that, that the sort of the gatekeepers of culture are sort of making the big decisions about who's in or who's out, because we can all go online and do it ourselves. We don't need those kind of permissions. But ironically, because there is now this sort of heightened interest in, in performance, um, because people can see it, because they can see it online and experience it online, that's actually sort of led to a real increased institutional em embrace and all kinds of recognitions and all kinds of invitations to sort of bring these kind of works into the, into the fold and into the, into the academy. Um, and we can see that happening in all kinds of places. I mean, the first, the first Freeze Masters in London, I mean, half of, half of Freeze Masters, half of the stalls, um, were exhibiting, selling, um, performance ephemera documentation, um, Tate exhibitions, all kinds of Tate exhibitions now involve performance. And Tate archives are also kind of really privileged in performance, have got a whole sort of initiatives around, around performance. So this kind of heightened visibility has kind of given a profile to sort of previously excluded um, practices in all kinds of interesting ways and opened up all kinds of opportunities for artists. Um, but it's also... Um, sort of with this kind of embrace and with this profile um, and this kind of bringing in um, this kind of work into the academy through its archive, through its document, through its archiving and documentation also ranges all, raises all kinds of challenging issues um, around the sort of the, um, the decontextualisation of work, uh, the depoliticisation of work and the sanitising of lots of work that, um, and the kind of compromising of a lot of performance arts really kind of original disruptive intentions. It tends to be kind of controlled and contained. But it also raises kind of questions about um, the kind of confusions, it's things that Hugo was talking about, confusions and kind of conflations between the action and the object, um, uh, you know, which is the true work. It also kind of tends to distort all kinds of um, histories as well, the kind of provenance, the provenance of work. So the kind of it's decontextualization removes it from certain kind of his, historical context. And, and the real kind of burning question, which again Hugo touched on, is about the authorship and ownership of the image. And one of the uh, one of the other 360 artists, Hayley Newman, she's uh, looking a lot of that in her research about who has copyrights over the work, who who owns 
who owns the work. And, um, and questions about what is the true work. Hugo showed those, those, those two kind of that, those two brilliant images of Franco, where the top half was the artwork and the bottom half was the documentation. That it was just, there were two halves of, this, of the same image. So what's the true work? Is it, is it, is it the, the, the performance itself or is it its, sort of, it's, its record? And the three images I want to show all sort of kind of um, sort of speak to that. Am I showing? That? Oh, I feel like. There are three images, I'll just very briefly say what they are. The first is an image of uh, the American performance artist Ron Athey. And it's an image by Catherine, it's not that one, um, that, that one. Um, it's, that's Ron Athey and the, the photographer is Catherine Opie. And Ron and Catherine were very good friends and um, they decided to do a collaboration taking images of some very iconic um, uh, sort of scenes from Ron Athey's work and to do it on was at the time the world's largest Polaroid camera it was in New York and um, absolutely stunning series of massive massive images and they're included in um, Tate Liverpool exhibition curated by Adrian George called Art Lives and Videotape and we all walked into the gallery and the first thing we saw these Ron images and we were absolutely thrilled to bits to see Ron uh, certainly at that, at that period um, to see Ron Athey in, in Tate Gallery but um, Ron's name was nowhere to be seen. So the only, there was this work was credited as an image by Catherine Ophi, full stop. Um, and there was quite sort of, you know, big stushy about that. And the work had been, had been loaned by Catherine uh, Ophi's gallery to Tate, and they, their only sort of, um, uh, the, the, the only things that they could sort of deal with was that this was a, a, an object, this was, this was an image by, by, by Catherine Ophi. And it was quite a long sort of legal battle and long conversations between Ron and Catherine to actually get Ron, Ron's name even attributed. The second image um, is very similar. Um, not, not that one, the other one, that one. Um, this is an artist called uh, Zhu Ming. Um, he was one of the uh, Beijing, Beijing East Village artists working in the 1990s. These were artists who furiously documented their work because it was really the only way for them to sort of reach an audience and only sort of material evidence that this work had existed. So uh, Zhang Guan was one of those artists, uh, 12 square metres being the most famous piece, and um, two aqua metres were anonymous out in and all those kind of works. Um, and Zhu Ming was one of those artists, and this, um, this image was included in an exhibition, that, a touring exhibition that was at the V&A called Between the Past and the Future, or the Future, uh, anyway, the Past, Present, Futures. Um, and again, uh, absolutely no credit for this uh, for the artist. The only the only person that was credited was was the photographer. So this had sort of turned from a, a documentation of a performance work into a true work by a photographer, and this artist was not acknowledged at all. And then the third image um, is this one, um, which is by Manuel Bezon, who Hugo referred to earlier. And Manuel was aware of these kind of issues of, of, of authorship and ownership and collaborations between artists and between performance artists and photographers. And so he started a, a, a process of um, trying to create um, images with artists. So they're not documentation of performances, they're not portraiture, they're collaboration collaborations between a photographer and artist to create an image that they jointly own. They jointly own it in terms of um, accreditation but they also, more importantly, jointly own it in terms of money. So they're both able to use those images, but they also are able, they also have sort of equal um, equal relationship to the uh, financial value of the work itself. <coughs> <coughs> <coughs>
a whole range of my own personal interests in in the status of various archives, in the way that that, that sort of archives become historicised, the, 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 the official archive in relationship to the personal archive, and also um, a, a, a relationship which is quite important both to my work and to the stuff which I'm doing with Art360, which is about the kind of stability of the old analog image, the analog negative, and the instability, the accidental, the often accidental instability of the digital image. Because digital images, as many of us know now, the digital images that we made in the, in the 1990s have become almost inaccessible. And so part of what I'm doing now is about the recovery of those images. And this actually seemed like a really interesting and important project in relationship to that. It, it was a residency in the, um, city, in the city archive in Birmingham, which is my, it, it's my, I am home, home town, which I did in um, 2005. Um, and as part of that, I was encountering and working with a whole range of these really interesting archives. So one of them was the area of Daesh collection. Um, to cut um, a long story short, Ernest Daesh was a commercial photographer who was working in the Sparkbrook and Mosley um, area of the city um, from like the 1950s through to the 1970s. He ran a commercial studio. Um, and as part of what he did, um, a lot of the incoming migrants to that to that particular part of Berber and we can walk forward and visit would visit his here some space to get their um, formal photos made and these were people from the Caribbean from the Indian subcontinent and so um, um, there's this incredible archive now, uh, what happened is that um, the space closed in the 1970s and was lying derelict it was forgotten about and an incredible uh, uh, um, for, uh, photography historian Pete James, um, who's, who's unfortunately passed away now, did some incredible research work um, and discovered this derelict studio of this commercial photographer and found all these, all these boxes of glass negatives and all this other ephemera and stuff basically in this der derelict space. Those were taken into, into the municipal archive so it became part of the archive. Um, and as a part of that, of that project, I came across these boxes. Uh, the Met End, which hadn't been opened at all since that initial moment, moment that they were closed up. And they contained these incredible glass negatives, um, mostly from the 1960s, of, of these now unknown people, because... Um, um, the records of who these people are had been lost. So once again, these issues about ownership, about all these things are big, and come kind of the um, key here. And um, I became interested in this performative act in that moment of opening these boxes and holding these hundreds of, of glass plates <coughs> up within the archival space and then re-photographing those with a digital camera. And so, um, there was this, this, this interest in, in these images which it had been made in a particular moment in, in the 1960s through a collaborative act with Ernest Dice and the people that had sat for this photograph. Then they, in re-photographed by me on a digital <coughs> camera in, in 2005. The reason why I was actually really interested in this is that um, the resultant work, um, even though now it exists as a video piece um, of these of these positive images with the negative in the middle, they're morphing into a negative of themselves in a in way, re um, in in a way. Um, Attempting to to uh, um, error the kind of act of the of the conventional negative um, that was actually done through a digital.
digital process. And so um, um, the, the work now is being, is being circulated as a, as a video work. However, the original work um, well, was when I was quite interested in using um, what was then an interactive authoring program called, called the Dyke Art Director, which we used to make like, lots of interactive work. But this wasn't going to be an interactive project. It was a project which kind of used uh, um, the, the capability of that software to, to, to um, present things which were unique to that moment of viewing through using randomness. And so whenever you saw the work in the gallery, it would be, within the, in theory, unique to that moment of viewing. And so when yeah, you saw that piece in 2010, on the 5th of September, what you saw was supposed to be unique to the moment of viewing. And so it had that kind of idea of instability built into it, or the flexibility, or, or, or the fluidic nature of, of the digital as opposed to the analogue that are built into the work. It didn't really work, fortunately. However, that was the idea. And now it's a video work which is circulating in different ways. However, I just want to go on to the next piece, which also, oh, next one again. Yes, which also comes from that project. Um, I wanted to speak about this in terms of, of that relationship between the public archive and the private archive. Because um, the, um, the other thing which, which intrigued me about, about the AM Dice archive was that it was local t to where I grew up. And so halfway through my encounter with this archive, I began to come across, or I came across an image of my father wow. inside the archive. <laughs> then I went home and said, oh, they saw that. And then I realized all the photographs, the uh, a wedding album, had been taken by Daesh. <laughs> now, um, the image in the middle of the, in the, in the streets, the image which I grew up with, it's an image of my mother at the age of about 21, um, which had been on the mantelpiece at the Act of Home. And that was actually taken, that was a Daesh image, it was taken in the Daesh studio. Um, and as part of, of, the, um, of the residency, I came across this image. It, it, it was a wide image of Daesh's studio. And it, it, in the corner were the same <laughs> objects which appeared in this image of my mother. And so just this act of kind of repositioning re this image from the personal archive into this, into this public municipal archive, I began to kind of think around particular things, which, which I'm still thinking about. It was never actually a piece, but it was the beginning of an interaction between the, um, the you know, public and the personal. And just quickly, this last, this, this final image is of a project which was um, done in 2007. Uh, once again, I've been quite literal about this idea of, of, of archives. This, and on the way back from the gallery, it was lost. So it, it became lost, lost for trees. And I just wanted to, because um, a lot of work no longer exists, and this big day, it becomes an example of a thing which, which the only thing which literally remains of the work is the archival photograph of the work. And, and why this has become quite interesting to me is that we are now in this kind of protracted um, dispute with the insurers of the people that kind of shipped the work back and delivered it to, to God knows where, but we haven't been able to find out where this work has gone. Um, and, and the people who insured it have been like really, really slow and intransigent. And at, at, at one point, there was this really interesting exchange where we received a letter from the insured robbers who um, said, I thought you said that this was a piece of art. <laughs> All we see is some paint pots and a few books. How is that art? <laughs> <laughs> and it was out, it was just in it, which is of art. And so, in a sense, we then had to backtrack and say, okay, this is the work in the context of the, these objects may look like this, but it's the context which then 
um, 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 gives the work AA in logic. I was just interested in that, in that idea of the status of the work, you know, being dependent on the context which the documentation creates for that work. That's why that's what, and that's all I to say. to a few more than three images. So um, I kind of come here today conflicted about my relationship to the archive. Much of my work as an artist has been in some way connected to the archive, its gaps and omissions, or respond to specific content found within it, within it, or working with the nature of the archive itself and the protocols of classification and order that are in use in that particular archive. One of the first works I made was based on an image found in the Royal Anthropological Archives in London it was a black and white image, taken in the late 1800s in Singapore, of a Chinese male prisoner standing in front of a gridded backdrop, naked and in shackles. One arm was outstretched, holding a measuring stick, and the type, um, typewriter written caption below the image said, Chinese male convict. The image was part of a colonial anthropological project of racial profiling. This image alone was not of value singularly. Anthropometric photography as a sub-discipline relied on the machinery of the archive to centralize and collect data, producing the conditions with which to compare and contrast racial types. So the Chinese prisoner image is only one among thousands of these images, or these types of images, brought together by the colonial archive so as to produce knowledge and organize visibility. Um, so in a way, in response to this idea of uh, this panel thinking about organization of visibility. With this in mind, there is a question that remi remains open for me, which is about complicity and continuity. One might argue that any expansion or addition made to this particular form of archive continues as problematic. How do we think about the decolonial approach to the archive? How do we activate Walter, Walter Magnolia's ideas of delinking or creating epistemic disobedience within the archive? And how do artists' archives or artists' archiving <coughs> inform our understanding of the work being made, the conditions or landscapes they are made within? Returning to the anthropometric image, I paid at the time, which was in the mid-90s, around £20 to get a copy of this image and went to include it in a work, which was funded by an Arts Council Black Arts Video Award. It was later shown at the Town Art Gallery, um, open in Eastbourne, where it won a prize, and on the back of that I was given a solo show and was also awarded an Arts Foundation Award. Last year I was asked to show this work, but realised I no longer had a working copy of the work. The original pneumatic tapes had deteriorated and I had never made a digital transfer. I also did not have any documentation of the work installed. This anecdote is just an underscoring of the non-neutrality of the archive and the historical origins and the conflicting, <coughs> conflictual nature of the desire to organize visibility. It's also to suggest a connection or relationship between the visible and the non-visible, or the appearing and the disappearing. The slides I want to show focus on a series of images collected and produced by artists. So this first slide um, shows two artists I'm currently interesting interested in doing research on for my next project. Um, both the artists are no longer alive, but leave behind, in addition to their artworks, material collections. So Dora Gordine um, is an artist in the bottom, and Kim Lim at the top are seen working in their studios. I'm interested in these images less for the artworks than for the conditions in which the works are, were made. For Dora Gordine, we see her working in an Atap house in Malaysia, and for Kim Lim in her studio in London, um, in, in the UK. We see artworks and we see tools, we see images of other artists' works and their own works too. Um, if I could just have the next slide, please. So for Kim Lim, we see some of her influences in the images pinned up. Um, and here we also have an image of Kim Lim and her husband, William Turnbull, on holiday in front of Angkor Wat. This is a screen grab from a video made by the son of Kim and William. These images are not official images taken by a gallery. Most of them seem more likely to be taken by a family member or friend. Dora Gordine's materials exist in Dorich House, which is part of Kingston University. <coughs> Dorich House is a studio museum. Dora left instructions that the house um, that she lived and worked in was to be made into a museum um, where her own collection and her works would be shown after her death. The images of her and her work can be found in Dorich House archives. 
Kim's images and archive, on the other hand, seem to be in the safekeeping of her children, who have had to manage um, and keep the material. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so this is, in a way, just trying to sort of show a sort of tracing through of finding images um, and also kind of recognizing the source of where you find them. So the first image was found um, was a screen grab of a video that the son had made. And the second, in trying to find the, with the full image of this, I come across it in art image. Um, so here we have the image of Kim and William traveling in Cambodia. Note the context the image is found in, which is art image, which is also um, part of the family of Dax and Art360. Um, so I've understood something that I didn't understand before, which is a kind of a connection between Art360, Dax, um, and Art Image, and the way in which this image um, may, the original may still be with the, um, the, 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 the family, um, but it's also being disseminated through these kind of um, platforms. Um, so this shift from personal archives to institutional archives is something which seems to be happening more often. Um, just recently I heard that Keith Kahn from Moti Roti has his um, archive in, in the V&A, um, and a few years ago Sh Shaheen Morali's Panchea archive went into the Tate Special Collection. Um, can I have the next image, please? <coughs> so the images here are of a collection of um, a Singaporean artist and independent archivist called Ko Nyang Hao. In the past decade, Ko's collection of material, which ranged from photographs he has taken personally, news clippings, catalogues, flyers, press releases, journals, um, they've all become pivotal in the writing and thinking about Singaporean art history. In many ways, he is seen as the chronicler of the last 30 odd years of art making in Singapore. And if you look at publications with ha which have a historical focus on art practice, invariably you will see that the images are actually of his, his images. He's done all of this independently of institutional support. Um, the actual images here show a shift in his practice um, of archiving. From the archiving at the top left um, as a sort of collection of materials to the archive as art practice below. Um, in a way, there's a kind of reasoning for this. In 2015, there were negotiations for the newly established Singapore National Gallery to buy his archive. Such a resource would have been pretty much impossible for them to have developed themselves and far too costly. But the discussions eventually didn't amount to anything, as a stalemate occurred around how and what they could, that they would acquire. What became apparent was that the National Gallery wanted to cherry pick material. They didn't want everything. They wanted the resources, but they seemed less interested in the structure of his archive or his subjectivity. What perhaps is so special about this archive is Coe himself and his own attachment and knowledge about the material. Declining to sell them his archive, but in need of doing something with it, Coe began developing a way of displaying the archive, which acknowledged his curatorial and artistic role in collecting, but also seemed to resist the co-opting of his work into an institutional or national agenda of history writing. Um, this morning I got a Facebook message from him in response to me saying that I might mention his work. He sent me an image taken by the Singaporean artist Chung Siok Ting in 1978 in Acme Gallery, London of the artist's um, work, Tang Da Wu. And previously, when I was wandering on Facebook about an exhibition I had shown ceramic work in a long, long time ago, he almost instantly posted an image of my work on the front cover of the exhibition catalogue. So he's kind of fundamental on a kind of level of the nation, but also within um, artists' own practices and records of their own work. Um, OK, so final image. One more to go. Um, so these final images are from a recent publication by David Tay and David Morris called Artist to Artist Independent Art Festivals in Chiang Mai, 1992 to 98. And they accompany a text which is based on a series of oral history interviews. The photographs shown are not captioned. There is no individuation being made in their use, and they are not referred to specifically in the text. The festivals in focus are a series of underexplored events, um, self-initiated artist festivals that now have that have not until now been given much attention. The author David writes about becoming aware through dialogue with various artists over several years of, um, of discussions of the pivotal, important, uh, pivotal importance of these largely unwritten histories of self-organized festivals, both within Thai art history but also transnationally within the region. In the book he mentions that after years of these conversations, 
he realized that at no point had anyone ever mentioned a single work of art or produced a document of the event or suggested that he look for any. The Chiang Mai social installation um, seemed to belong to a kind of spoken law, no less substantial for being immaterial, but remembered and understood primarily through word of mouth. And this orality, whilst difficult in relation to conventions of art history writing, also reflected the nature of the events themselves. He writes, Chiang Mai installation was largely, has largely been remembered and understood through word of mouth. Oral cult culture is characterized by performativity, presence, collectivity, and non-fixity, all terms that could equally be applied to Chiang Mai installation, social installation. This is also an anarch anarchistic form of remembrance, resistance to governance and control. He quotes, and I'll end with this, um, from James C. Scott from The Art of Not Being Governed, that oral tradition is, in most respects, inherently more democratic than a written tradition for at least two reasons. First, the ability to read and write is typically less broadly distributed than the ability to tell stories. Secondly, there is rarely any simple way to educate among variant tellings of, of oral history. Certainly, there is no fixed written text to which the variants can be compared for veracity.